Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 123 of the Citrix Session. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. Today is uh, December 12th, 2022. Got a very special guest with us today that a lot of the Citrix folks will know and love. But uh, first of all, Bill Sutton, Director of Services at Zintegra. Bill, how's it going? Going great, Andy. Still uh, still counting down those Christmas days, getting those presents together? Something like that, yep. You know, scrambling to get it done. So my kids are older. We have uh, Secret Santa. You only have to buy one gift. I think I know what I'm going to buy my person, but I still don't officially know. And I've got four days to do it before we go on family vacation, which, by the way, I'm spending a ton of money on getting my family ready for a ski trip and paying for lift tickets and flights and hotel rooms. And I still got to go out and buy a present for somebody. Say that's a present in and of itself, right? Man. Hopefully they appreciate it someday, especially when they go to have to pay for their own family Christmas vacations and yeah. still buy all the presents. Yeah. So we have Todd Smith with us. Todd is uh, director of uh, sales engineers for Canada. Todd, how's it going? I'm doing well, Yandy. How are you? Good. Have you uh, have you made a cold weather Canada trip yet in your new role? Uh, I, I haven't officially had a cold weather trip, although I was out there. I was out in Vancouver and Calgary uh, in early september and it was kind of chilly mm-hmm. but haven't haven't made it up there for the uh the winter yet but uh we we did have snow up here in boston over the weekend so i think it's going to be a, a dumper of a year what do you guys call it I, i'd call it a dumper of a year what's what's it going to be when it when it dumps on you guys like crazy it's a it's a it? wicked it's a wicked blizzard uh, i should have known yeah i get something or nor'easter well, we we talk football a lot on this call. I uh, I'm not a big football. I mean, I love football, but I don't watch it a ton. I'm so busy. But I think uh, Mr. Brady's coming to visit you Thursday night. Is that what I saw coming maybe yes. this weekend? Thursday night. Uh, it's, no, because we're playing. Um, we're playing tonight on uh, the Monday Night Football against the Arizona Cardinals in Arizona. So that's actually yeah. not a bad. Wouldn't yeah. be a bad road trip. But yeah, we we've got. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of uh, tough games coming up ahead of us. So, but you have the Buccaneers this weekend, is that right? Uh, I believe so. And how will you guys act when Mr. Magic comes home? That's always the Brady show when he shows up. Yeah. Should be interesting. Yeah. Well, we have uh, Chris Fleck with us. And Chris, I'm not even going to pretend to say what your title is. I'll let you explain it. But uh, you are a legend in the Citrix world. Somebody showed me... Um, a phone the other day accessing a virtual desktop as if it was something new. I'm like, <laughs> uh, I think I know a guy that's been talking about that for a long, long time. I'm, I'm referring to the Nirvana phone. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's funny. Yeah. We, so I guess, first of all, what's your current role at Citrix? What do you do every day? Yeah. So I'm a technical fellow uh, at Citrix, but uh, my role now is vice president of product for uh, our ecosystems and verticals. So we've uh, uh, both consolidated what we're doing around uh, our strategy or for cloud partners and Citrix Ready and strategic alliances in general, um, and, and then uh, have a particular interest. We've created uh, a new focus area for our top three verticals uh, being government, healthcare, and finance, um, hmm. and then uh, building out the uh, the tech community. So the CTPs and the user groups and the customer advisory board. And so uh, basically kind of managing that whole tech ecosystem. And you said several things there that interest me from a business perspective, especially the one about the verticals, the uh, government and healthcare. And we were just talking, we're doing a lot of work on our gov side with, with healthcare, government healthcare. Uh, That seems to be an area that's really adopting Citrix type solutions. Love to talk to you more about that. Great. Sure. Um, I like to think that uh, your job is a job I would love to have if I could just go pick a job because what you do and what we do is, you know, passionate around the space. Um, what's your favorite thing about current role? Um, so that I, I would, probably the favorite thing would be more um, the, this tech community engagement being, a, you know, where, you know, I've already always kind of been involved, but yeah. You know, now now it's uh, part of my day job too. <laughs> so, you know, reaching out to whether it's directly with customers or the the tech community at large, uh, uh, the, those are uh, fun parts of the job. 
Well, and that ties right into the blog that we're going to look at here in a second. I, as you were talking, several things came to mind. Tell us, uh, tell us the story around the Nirvana phone. I'm going to ask you about the Google glasses, and then I'm going to ask you about provisioning server, and I could ask you about 30 more technologies, but we'll just, those three have come up since us on the, the call here started talking to each other before we hit record. Uh, Google glasses. At one point, you wore those things everywhere, and I was yeah. watching you to figure out if that thing was real or not. Right. But, yeah, so um, it it's you know it it's still it's still coming you know I think it's still going to happen uh, I think uh, it's inevitable that uh, you know it, we want to be able to engage with the the smallest more most pervasive kind of interface and um, it's it's going to happen at some point when those glasses become light enough and the battery lasts long enough and they don't look as weird as Google glasses. Uh, and, and so actually literally just uh, Friday, we had a, a tech uh, event here in Florida and it was great. We we had uh, Ronnie Abovitz uh, come talk. He was the uh, the founder of, uh, of Magic Leap. And so it was, uh, it was pretty neat to to talk to him again and uh, get his you know his story from you know the actually goes back to like a dorm room at University of Miami when he came up with the first uh, uh, orthopedic uh, surgery uh, startup uh, which he then sold and uh, then rolled that into uh, to Magic Leap and uh, now he's working on some you know next generation things which. Uh, arguably could go beyond the Google Glass augmented reality in terms of, you know, neural link type stuff. But yeah. that's uh, <laughs> that's really getting far out there. So other than watches, has any other technology wearable actually taken off? Um, well, you, you certainly could argue uh, uh, AirPods, right? You know, uh -huh. the, that's uh, that's taken off for sure, and it, it used to be weird, right, to see people with the the white things, dongles hanging out their ear, right? Yeah. Uh, but not anymore. <laughs> now that's you know uh, that's completely pervasive, right? Yeah. And and in fact, you know the the interface as well, the fact that uh, ambient um, communication and Siri and, and uh, Alexa and everybody is, you know, that that's now mainstream. So uh, I expect, uh, I expect that to, to continue as well. Well, that's funny. You mentioned the ear pods. I literally sleep in ear pods now in one ear or the other. My, my wife has a sound machine. I sleep in with, I put a podcast in and that puts me to sleep or a book. Right. And if I wake up in the middle of the night and start thinking about work, I'll put another one in. It's that's become so pervasive that I didn't even think of that as a wearable. Yeah, it's just yeah, that's right. But but do you remember when they were first came out? Oh yeah, handful of folks like me that would wear them. They were you know the the a holes yeah. <laughs> or the glass holes. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's that. Uh, the phone. I saw something last week. Maybe you've seen it where it's a it's a virtual phone that gets presented down to your device. And I don't think it's for phone calls, but all the apps that go on your phone, it runs virtually from the cloud, AWS, and right. it overlays your phone. Uh, but the Nirvana phone concept, you know, that's, I guess that's 20 years of you and others, including myself, right. kind of playing with that and knowing right. that it's coming, but yet to see it fully vet itself out. Where's the, where's that at? Yeah. Um, well, it, you know, it, it's interesting, right? Because it, it effectively is there now, right? You, it's there with, with both iPhone and, uh, and certainly the work we did with Samsung and Dex and the, you know, you've got a good, uh, yeah. Uh, virtual desktop interface there um you know i i guess it that's one that uh will continue to maybe be a a niche maybe a growing niche but it'll still be a niche and uh, you know we'll we'll see uh, if, if that takes that that next step up the the obstacle i think for for sure is um the fact that you, the, the keyboard and the mouse interface and some of those things are still obstacles when you look at, you know, a, an office environment where, um, you know, are those full size keyboard and mice going to be available? Yeah. And then, you know, uh, that then you can effectively just dock your phone and, and have that that virtual desktop environment. Um, you know, COVID, I think, has 
to has shifted things to where people were going, uh, you know, more to this this hybrid environment and in the office and uh, open seating and so forth. But when COVID hit, everybody got a laptop. And I think, you know, to, to a certain extent, that's a step backwards, right? And probably even impacts thin clients and some of those, you know, type implementations, because when everybody got a laptop, then that kind of sticks with them for a couple of years now, too. Um, well, I think, I, I, sorry, I, I, th I think, Chris, to your point about, you know, when when COVID came around and people went to go work from home, uh, they went from being a mobile worker, relying on phones, and relying on a laptop, and things like that, to being more of a static office worker, the, the office location just changed, right? So you move to you move from being working out of anywhere to working out of a fixed location almost every single day. Um, so the mobility market, I think, probably took a little bit of a, uh, a hit there. Um, but, you know, getting back to the Nirvana phone concept, I mean, you know, if you could have a, a combination of the phone and the Google Glass right. and some type of virtual keyboard uh, yeah. together, um, you know, the, the, the challenge with the Nirvana phone is when you start plugging in all these different devices onto uh, the phone looked like it was on life support um, and the experience was different, right? So you have to, you have to prepare the environment where you wanted to dock the phone into. Um, right. But the, the technology itself was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. The use case is a no-brainer. And I won't build a comment here. And Todd, if you have other comments about the two things we talked about so far, but Chris, if if Apple would just take the iPhone and make it a truly dockable, where you had a dock and a, a real keyboard and a real mouse and real peripherals could work, right? It, would it not take off overnight? Um, well, you know, may, we may see that, you know, when they're forced to do USB-C. Right, because the that that's clearly a obstacle, like right now, in fact, because I think what's happening is again as it relates to uh organizations that are now kind of set up for they're putting a display on the workstation. Um, but they and and now displays are you know standardizing on USB C, which is great. Um, but you know, with with the when it comes to iPhone. You still have to say, well, am I going to carry this adapter around, you know, another cable around with me or, you know, leave it at the workstation. It disappears and that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, but I, I they're, they're getting forced into USB-C. Right. So I think that that will create a, a step up uh, function. So that's curious to me when you say they're being forced in USB-C. I don't know that story. Is it someone actually forcing them or just the technology yeah. path is driving them there? No, um, I'm not sure the dates, but yeah, uh, the European uh, uh, regulatory uh, groups are are forcing it. Yeah. Hey, Bill, anything we've covered that you want to ask Chris about? I know you're technologist like the rest of us. No, I, I think it's interesting that the concept of the the Nirvana phone. I, I think that to some degree, the 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 creation of the iPad Pro is kind of taken the tablet form factor and kind of started to mix it with the laptop form factor. So I think that that was kind of a shift towards some sort of uh, leveraging of Apple related technology or tablet technology um, to to create, you know, an, something that you could carry with you much more, much easier. But certainly they haven't gotten that far with the phones, not yet anyways. And it'll be interesting to see where that goes going forward. Yeah. So one, you know, maybe we're going to circle back to like currently in Citrix, but Right. Uh, before we get there, while we're talking about the future, uh, anybody listening, um, if you haven't tried it yet, and you probably have seen it or maybe saw a headline or a tweet or something, uh, I would recommend uh, going out and kicking the tires on chat GPT. Uh, just Google it. You'll find it if, if you haven't seen it or heard of it. It's, uh, in a way, a... Uh, Open AI, one of the uh, AI initiatives that uh, actually Elon Musk was one of the co-founders. He, he's off doing you know different things uh, now, but it's incredibly scary good. Uh, so okay, here we go. Uh, so I put it up on the screen for those that watch the video later. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out what this thing is. What um, I think I got exposed to this without knowing it the other day. What is it? So it, it's basically a um, a new chat service 
that is augmented uh, or artificial intelligence, machine learning based, that has, it, it's not real time. You know, it, it, they, they basically it read the entire internet up until 2001. <laughs> and, and it can create really unbelievably realistic text um, and you can say, write us, write an email, write a poem, write a song, but guess what? It can also write code. And so you can say, and I was doing it the other day, uh, like write a, uh, a PowerShell, uh, script for publishing for published content with Citrix. And it did it and it created the PowerShell, uh, script. Um, it can go off and do queries. It can literally write just, it's just phenomenal. Uh, what, so not only it can write original um, content and it can also like in the case of code, if, if you've got a bug, if you've got something not working, you can post the code and say, find what's wrong. Wow. And find what's wrong. Or you could take, you could take an essay and say, make it better. <laughs> and it fixes the grammar for you. Wow. So anyway, yeah, that's uh, a bit forward looking, but incredibly um, insightful in terms of, or impactful when you look at like how this may impact the future. I'm, I'm not sure whether to be impressed or scared. Yeah, well, I, I tell you some like right now, what I'm sure it's it's only been a week old, and I'm sure there's like thousands of kids doing their homework with this now, you yeah. know, like writing book reports and essays and college admissions. <laughs> it's, it's just like incredible. So anyway, let's circle back to. Uh, well, here's here's the Hypori thing that I mentioned where it's a phone that gets presented down to your phone that looks like a phone, but it keeps you, it allows people to use their personal phone or, you know, have security. I don't know if you've seen this or not. It's pretty, pretty cool to check out. I, let's I, let's I, talk. Go ahead. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, go ahead. Well, let, let's go one more trip down memory lane for something that did work in Israel. Uh, when you and I and, and uh, Todd and Bill jumped on the call, uh, we started talking about this thing called provisioning services, which is at the time seemed unbelievably impossible as well. That's how you and Todd got to know each other. You want to you want to tell that story and how that turned out? Sure. Yeah, that that's a fun story uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, one. So so. When when we um, first announced and, and jumped into the VDI space, right? So we that that originally came about. If if you recall, and um, some of the listeners may, uh, you know, VDI was first announced to the world. It was a three way uh, joint venture uh, offering with Citrix, VMware, and IBM. Um, so that that was that that came out and. Uh, became, you know, pretty much a, a new industry standard, right? Beyond just the multi-OS kind of uh, multi-user OS, it was like, okay, everybody gets their own uh, virtual machine. And what became obvious to me, uh, because uh, we, my team, we were building, you know, early versions of that and creating solutions, using it internally. And it became really obvious that like storage was going to be the limiting factor. You know, just just both in terms of the amount of storage and then the um, the manageability of you know giving everybody at the time twenty gigs, which sounds like nothing, but even that added up to a lot. And then we gave them forty gigs, and that's how you know. So it was obvious that that was going to become a, a really limiting factor, and that's what prompted me to you know like go be go look at okay, how do we solve that next limiting factor, which was going to be storage. And, uh, and in fact, that's where uh, came across Ardens um, and uh, decided to, uh, you know, I, I got it initially, as soon as it was described to me, um, you know, it's like, yeah, this is really relevant. Uh, and as a matter of fact, before, this even goes back before this time, which is, uh, I, I did a startup uh, before Citrix, between IBM and Citrix, I did a startup that was a spinoff from IBM where we had virtual storage. We, we had a, a blade server and a virtual disk and you could drag and drop virtual disks. And it basically was an advanced version of Pixie uh, that allowed you to do uh, diskless booting. And, and one of the things I, I never got the chance to do, but I wanted to separate the hardware from the software and you know take it further. Uh, but when I saw Ardence, I was like, 
wow, this is what I want. This is what I was looking to, to actually do to have that flexibility from a storage standpoint. And so I, I went up and met uh, with uh, with Ardens and met uh, Todd, the, the team, you know, the Ardens team. Um, and at the time, you know, it, it was funny. They were kind of giving me the pitch and it's like, I get it, I get it, I get it. You know, it's like, I understood it entirely, uh, but it was still awesome. I still remember you guys had this big wall of PCs uh, where you were able to, uh, you know, reboot everything and display, uh, you know, within seconds, uh, all the, the same image on how many, how many uh, images or PCs was that Todd? So we had 255 physical devices because we wanted to be able to show that we could we could boot an entire class C address space um, from a single image <clears throat> and then be able to quickly flip that image over to, you know, in, in the video shows us going from uh, Windows 7 to Windows 8 or Vista right. <clears throat> and then being able to take the same thing and flip it over. Eventually, we were able to flip it over to a Linux environment as well as a uh, server-based OS. Yeah. That that's awesome. I mean, demos demos are killer, right? They still yeah. are, right? And that was that was killer for me. So I, it's like I understood the the concept going in, but just seeing that wall of displays was yeah. it was awesome. And so yeah, what um, what I also kind of discovered uh, through that meeting was um, I wasn't the only one, or Citrix, you know, we weren't the only ones interested. And, uh, I could uh, I could kind of uh, figure, read the tea leaves, uh, that, that there were other quarters, uh, interested in, uh, the company and the technology. And, uh, I still remember, uh, walking out, um, uh, in, into the parking lot and, uh, calling Mark Templeton on, on his cell and saying, Mark, uh, we got to buy these guys and we got to do it fast. And, yeah. uh, you guys bought them. Other people licensed it for a while. I remember that story, correct? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah. And, and I love uh, what you guys just talked about with the demos. I, that's what I love about our space more than anything else. I mean, really smart guys doing routing and switch, but you can't demo that stuff the way you can the end user technologies that we've been playing with all these years. And, and I use the word play. I, I literally mean play. It's yeah. just fun to play with. Yep. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure Bill remembers the first time he booted into Ardence, which became provisioning services and was like, uh, this isn't possible, but I like what it's doing. Oh yeah, I saw that video that uh, they speak of more and showed it more than once to customers. And then the company I was working for at the time sent me up to uh, what is it, Waltham at the Waltham. time? Yeah. Yeah. And I spent a few days with Todd and company up there getting trained on it. I think right after or very shortly after Citrix had acquired them, because uh, we were a company I worked for was a platinum partner, and so we got on the train very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think after about two weeks after Bill's trip to uh, to Waltham, I was down in Virginia, right, going and visiting a couple of customers with Bill, and yep. uh, you know it was a variety of different use cases too. It was uh, classroom environments, it was mm -hmm. healthcare workstations, it was a variety of other uh, other great use cases. That was that was the big benefit of of the technology was it was adaptable, and we could we could solve a lot of problems that way. Yep. Yeah, and, and still about... today, right? I mean, yep. it, yeah, yes, is you know, it's just become standardized with so many customers. Uh, you know, they uh, they they won't give it up, and you know, that's that's been like an obstacle to um, some of the the ones that that want to go to the cloud, but they're they're committed to to PVS and the benefits there. So, you know, the the fact that we got that uh, now working in uh, in the clouds has made a big. Uh, opportunity for for those kind of customers as well my favorite thing about provisioning services is the bridge that created between the physical and then the virtual world while we were all still trying to figure out how to do that uh disc layering stuff so the mcs could be a reality it created a bridge that was so good that it's still in existence to the point where you're even having to move it to the cloud because some people just won't give it up yeah well, Chris, thanks for joining us today. The uh, the blog that you wrote is, says a look at the future of Citrix with our CTPs. I thought this would give us a great opportunity to have you explain what's going on at Citrix and explain your conversation you had with the CTPs, the Citrix technology professionals, uh, and um, 
with the cloud software group. And this is just a really good chance for some real citrites. Uh, everybody on the phone here on the call call here, uh, the podcast to yep. really kind of vet out what's going on over there and, and what we should expect into the future. So we can, we can walk through the blog or we can just use this as an opportunity to talk to you about what you talk to the CTPs about. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, so, you know, one of the things that, that, um, uh, became obvious as, as we've, you know, so everybody knows, I think at this point, right. So we've gone private. So we went from a public company to a private company. Uh, and now we're owned by uh, two um, private equity uh, companies uh, that are uh, effectively, they're kind of acting as our board, but we've, uh, we've also got a, a, a new CEO. So there was consternation about, um, you know, what's the strategy, who's left, and people are looking at LinkedIn and seeing people leave the company. And, you know, so it, it became obvious uh, in, in talking with some some customers, as well as, you know, some of the folks in the in the CTP, kind of like the tech community, you know, not just CTPs, but in general, the, the folks that engage with us and, and our solution providers like, like yourself, that, you know, there, there's some concern out there, like, you know, what's what's happening with Citrix and we're seeing people leave and, you know, are, are they going to continue to invest? Are they going to continue to innovate? And, um, you know, wanted to start to get this message out, like the, the, the people running Citrix now. So Citrix is now a business unit within uh, Cloud Software Group. So uh, Cloud Software Group is now kind of the umbrella company. Um, and so... Uh, that, that we uh, we find we have a good use now of cloud.com uh, the domain so check out cloud.com as kind of this this uber level uh, umbrella company uh, but we've merged with Tipco but we've also now uh, kind of identified what are the primary business units that uh, will be effectively managing their their own business per se and and investing and, and growing after the segment that they're uh, best suited for and for Citrix itself so we're keeping the the uh, the brand and keeping the the product set uh, but I think most importantly if you look at the top line so uh, you know we've got Sridhar, uh uh, Malapali, who's been with Citrix for 22 years, I think. Uh, we've got uh, Calvin, who's been here 20 years. We've got Jatendra, who's been here over 20 years. I'm hitting 20 years next month. So the the folks that are uh, in the leadership positions at at Citrix, uh, you know, we've got lots of experience, and I think you know, pretty good engagement, right, with the the customers and the the solution providers and the, the the tech community at large and uh we're 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 the ones now that are uh given the the responsibility to to take citrix forward and uh and invest and grow and that's our mission you know so our our mission is is exactly that like go take care of our best customers take care of uh you know the the not only the legacy we would built but also that sector of delivering secure, manageable applications out to uh, whether it's virtual desktops or mobile apps or web apps. It's like that's that's our core value prop. It's been our core value prop, and uh, and and we're getting the investment we need to uh, to pursue that. So that's kind of like the top level message. Is like literally we're we're. You know we're we're in good shape and we're investing and growing. Uh, you know the the areas that that we think are strategic, um, and and not only from a product standpoint, but also some of the you know the the guidance, not only guidance but even you know resourcing uh, that that we're uh, effectively planning for now, like the whole twenty twenty three, is things like. Uh, tech support and simplification. Um, I think we're, we're a lot of our customers and maybe, you know, resellers as well and solution providers, you know, have, have found complexity in terms of, you know, just the, the programs and the SKUs and, you know, entitlements and what goes with what. And some of those things are kind of recognized obstacles that uh, we're, we're now going to prioritize to improve and make it easier to do business with Citrix, make it easier to engage with us. 
and quite frankly, do a better job with tech support and be more responsive and you know provide the the level of support that uh, our, our customers you know expect and and deserve. So, you know, we're we're really looking to uh, double down on uh, on the customers that and the segments that that we're going after. I mean, to me, that that all sounds perfect, right? I don't I don't uh, think I could have asked for anything better. Todd, what's your take on the changes that you know about that um, Chris is articulating here? Yeah, I, I'm really excited about it. I mean, I think there's, uh, you know, some some great folks being put into leadership positions on the product side as well as on the uh, on the rest of the company's uh, core core roles. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things, right? So that Chris just mentioned, right? Focusing on uh, servicing our existing customers and making sure that they get the best products out of us, uh, being able to grow uh, into areas where it's going to add value or open up new uh, spaces for us and our customers to solve those problems. And the biggest thing is, you know, kind of getting back into a technology leadership role um, in the industry. I think those are critical things. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. Bill, any comments? Yeah, I I would echo what uh, what Todd said, and and I agree with you, Andy. I'm, and this is I don't really have much to comment on. I'm really um, in, happy to see things moving forward, and and the and the right folks look like they're in the right places in the organization. You know, Sridhar, I've known for a number of years, and he's a he's a really sharp technologist, and I think he'll uh, he'll 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 do very well in that role. And and I'm glad that he's still a part of it, as well as the other folks there as well. Yeah, Chris, I'll, I'll make this comment. Uh, you know, it had started to feel like the sales was starting to lead the company, and it was almost the tail wagging the dog. It, it feels like you guys are getting back to the the technology driving the company forward. Good technologies, which I believe you will drive everybody forward, with a little bit of help from marketing and, and partnerships like ours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, the reality is, we you know we we're shifting right the 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 resources and uh we we will be spending less a lot less on traditional marketing you know kind of like that blanket you know high level market marketing kind of initiatives um and we're going to uh shift to more of the technical marketing and peer to peer and again that's like why now I I own some of that right with the user groups and uh, you know with the the technical uh, folks that are out there in the community and we really want to you know pretty much I think you guys you, you know you help foster this right is there's a lot of our our existing customers they have Citrix champions right they're Citrix champions all over the industry uh, but we have to do a better job kind of feeding them right giving them. Uh, you know, what they need to, to get their job done, getting them what they need to, uh, whether it's doing demos to their business leadership, right, to show, you know, here's how this new feature could help the uh, the organization further. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of that the guerrilla marketing aspect of uh, getting technology in the hands of, of the folks that can make a difference. And uh, so that's where we're going to be putting, you know, resources as opposed to kind of like the high level uh, uh, message, uh, conventional marketing you've seen in the past. And, and I could be wrong here, but I think the addressable space is still very big. For example, if I were to go do a survey of, uh, clients out there who own Citrix, I wonder if they have just as many VPN licenses as they do Citrix licenses. Maybe I'm close, maybe it's one way or the other, but it's not all that disparate between the two. And I don't know about you, but customers should not be connecting through VPNs at this point when they don't have to. A perfect example. Yep. Right. They've got, uh, there's still lots of VPNs out there. There's still, uh, you know, there's, there's laptops, right. That are not necessarily being optimized the way they could be. Uh, there's uh, consumer browsers being used when they could be using an enterprise uh, browser. That's got the controls uh, that, uh, that, that puts them in a better uh, security posture. Uh, and and part of, you know, the, again, the strategy is we don't need high level marketing to reach the same customer that we're in already. <laughs> what we need is to better educate and better engage with the, the tech community 
uh, that's already in place uh, at those customers, but we, we've got to, you know, give them the compelling reasons and the compelling demos and and pilots to show here's how we can do a better job than a VPN uh, as a perfect example. And there's so much that we, the Citrix people don't know. I literally, I just did it. I just went to my Citrix workspace app, right clicked on it. And one of the options was uh, Citrix uh, browser, secure browser or something. Yeah. And I did not know until that moment that it was there. But as you said that, I'm like, crap, I'm using a consumer grade browser. Why am I doing that? And then boom, there it was. And and I, you know, I live this stuff every day. Uh, I, right. went quick, I went to the Amazon conference last week or two weeks ago. And the amount of people that are just now discovering the concept of uh, remoting protocols and desktop and app virtualization, it's unbelievable how many people have been in the dark all this time. Right, right. Well, I'm, I'm happy you, uh, you you discovered the, the browser. Uh, and so another thing we're doing to try to simplify per se is, you know, we, we kind of we probably messed up when we, with the the name the the secure browser which got conflated with well there's a secure browser service which is the hosted kind of version of a browser and then there's this new thing that we call workspace browser which was the local thing but when people say secure browser you weren't sure what they're talking about were they talking about the hosted thing or the local thing uh, and lots of folks, mo the majority of folks don't even know we have a local thing, <laughs> right? Uh, but so what we're doing now is, is again, helping simplify. And so we, we've renamed uh, the, the, the local browser, Citrix Enterprise Browser. So this is a enterprise worthy browser that gives you many of the same kind of security manageability features uh, that you get with a virtualized version of a browser, but without, quite frankly, the overhead, without the servers and without all of the infrastructure required. But you can do things like control, copy and paste and print and uh, manage, you know, exactly what's happening inside that browser. And then you can, you can deliver it with our secure private access uh, feature so that you don't need a VPN anymore. Uh, and so that's, a, I think, a killer opportunity for any solution provider, anybody inside a, a Citrix environment where you've got uh, CVAD today, you can now uh, uh, do this. Um, and so, yeah, that's a, that's a big one. And then what we did is we, we renamed the hosted version to uh, the remote, remote uh, browser isolation, RBI, which is kind of what the industry has already been calling it. So... So basically, you've got enterprise browser and remote browser isolation, and and they can work together uh, or independently. And so those are uh, those are two big pieces uh, again of our initiative uh, going forward. Because you know the reality is web apps keep growing, SaaS apps keep keep growing uh, in in terms of adoption. Um, but we don't think the legacy apps are disappearing. We think they're still there, especially for big companies. Uh, but being able to put them all together in the same place is, yeah. you know, uh, really valuable for for end users for sure, but also for IT. Um, and so that's actually, you know, a, another uh, change that we're making here. And I think it's in here someplace, but uh, it, and that is uh, storefront, right? So on-prem storefront. Uh, well, Chris, so could I highlight real quick? I just want to make sure everybody heard you on prem something in this case storefront <laughs> go ahead yeah. yeah so let me go deeper there right on prem anything right so when's the last time you heard a, a citrix marketing person talk about on prem anything <laughs> any any cloud company I, I do a lot of presentations and i talk about on prem for you in my data center and in the cloud if i'm not helping you understand all the above then i'm not really helping you i'm just driving you towards what i want you to do so i can make money off of you it needs to be an open conversation right right and so um part of our our strategy shift is and as you probably know you know the last couple of years we we pretty much went you know, all in on cloud uh, from the, the perspective of the, the product investment. Um, and we let uh, features or like storefront uh, effectively, you know, we're supporting them, but we weren't adding features to them. We were adding all the, you know, the new inventions and so forth to, to the cloud uh, versions with the intent to try, try to encourage, you know, customers to go there. 
but as we've kind of done a reset and we've done this reset over the course of this year and, you know, not only reset the organization, but also looking at the product and the reality is um, that, that our customers are continuing to tell us that even as they move to the cloud, most of them, especially the big ones are not going to go all in. They're going to go hybrid. Many of them are hybrid already. And so we, we, uh, realized and we're shifting now to say, all right, um, how do we best serve those customers that are, you know, and in some cases, even like the government scenario, on-prem is still the right story, even if it goes into right. a, you know, a, a private cloud or a gov cloud, uh, it's still the on-prem, you know, version of, effectively of the software stack. And yeah. so we are uh, we're going to be adding features to uh, critical components like storefront um, that that are uh, that that we think will be very uh, useful for our our customers. And uh, yeah, so there's you know the storefront in general, uh, and then there's specifically, for example, storefront uh, with with Netscare, Scalar, and uh, and the enterprise browser, and being able to. You know, provide a solution there um, that that doesn't have some of the uh, potentially obstacles uh, for adoption. You know that that we see you know, that we saw and and we're uh, effectively learning from. Yeah. Hey, Bill. Thoughts, comments on that? I could go. I could. I could point out twenty things I want to talk about, but I'm gonna give you the chance to, for you to do it. Well, obviously, I you know, being a technical guy, I want to I want to see the details and put it in my lab and all that as as most of us do. But uh, it certainly is encouraging. To see uh, see Citrix uh, taking you know kind of circling back to those customers that uh, that do have an on-prem presence and being able to, to provide them with the same the same level of of technology that that is offered today to a large degree in the cloud. So I, I like what they said in this what Chris said in this article about uh, meeting them meeting them where they are because I you know like you said a lot of customers are are hybrid cloud or they're even all on-prem and are starting to dip their toes in the cloud and. Obviously, they need the goodness of the cloud on-prem right now, and it looks like uh, Citrix is taking a step towards helping them meet that goal. So I'm going to tweak your word slightly, <laughs> meeting where they currently are, also meeting them where we think they're going to have to go. There's that uh, True. comment all the time about skating to where the hockey puck's going to be, not where it is. And I think we're all going to see a, a world where the right companies are going to be there when you need to fall back a little bit or, or mm-hmm. swivel or change what you were doing from your cloud strategy, which – there's going to have to be a lot of people that are at the very least going to have to change their strategy. Yeah. Agreed. Todd thoughts. I think it's, you know, for, for the past couple of years, I think customers have uh, really been responding back to us uh, with the fact that, you know, they're not ready to go to the cloud a hundred percent or they're restricted as to what they can do. So, you know, the, the fact that we've, that we've, returning to the message of, you know, we've got your back and we can adapt towards whatever your demands are and what your needs are um, and still consume and, and deliver using our technology. I think that's going to be a critical message to get out there. And, and once again, it's just, this is something that the community has been asking for uh, almost since we, the day we made the announcement that we're, we're moving to the cloud. Yeah. So this on-prem requirement uh, is not something that, and, and here's the thing: the, off, the oftentimes the customers aren't the one making the decisions about this movement to the cloud or not. It's regulatory. It's by, you know, uh, the government regulations. Or it could be banking regulations. It could be a variety of different reasons why they're doing it that are completely out of their control. Yeah, and and new new reasons could pop up tomorrow or a year yep. from now, whenever. Yeah, I think that's just a sign of Citrix letting the the technical guys who understand business run the company and, you know, going back to my tail wagging the dog thing, it, it, the customers and partners felt like it had kind of over rotated and it's good to reset it here. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Chris, one more uh, on the product side, uh, Citrix endpoint management coming back or maintaining. Can yeah. you explain that one to us? Sure. Yeah. Well, um, again, we probably over rotated on this one. Um, and uh, what, what, you know, we had uh, been going down a path to uh, end the life it, but we had so many of our customers uh, <laughs> uh, basically object and say, "Hey, you know, we we're using it. It's working for us. It's working great." Um, and and don't 
uh, don't let it, uh, you know, go into life. And we listened, quite frankly, you know, we, we said, all right. Uh, and again, some of this, some of those customers are again, big customers that are using the, uh, the on-prem versions of, uh, of, of that. And uh, they, it, it's just doing a really good job there. So we've, uh, uh, we, we looked at that decision and, and shifted uh, accordingly. So, you know, we're, we're now, going to continue that not only support but again where it makes sense to add features uh we'll we'll do that too yeah i think that's another uh evident of or evidence that you guys are listening to and seeing what's really going on i mean no matter if a company goes all in on cloud or what there's still going to be endpoints to manage and probably multiple endpoints per user to manage it's a very addressable space that just doesn't go away right yep yeah uh todd got chris on the hook here Anything you would like to ask him while we still got him for another minute? So, so yeah, uh, and Chris, I, I think the last point you made about the uh, bringing back the, the, the more of the technical community focused yep. uh, events and marketing events was, was absolutely critical. Um, I've been a huge proponent of the Citrix user group community before it actually became the CUGCs. Um, it's our way to get back in front of the folks that are asking the technical questions and doing the technical work um as a way to embrace them and, and you know help support them in what they're what they're doing on a daily basis and you know they're sharing information they're sharing best ideas best practices and more importantly it is a sense of community so i'm, I'm grateful to uh you know that's fallen under your uh your sphere of influence well thanks for the plug there uh so yeah, yeah i anybody listening i would Definitely encourage you to to just uh, if you haven't been to one or if you know any you know in the nearby towns, uh, go check it out and listen in or participate. And uh, and if you think you have a critical mass in a particular location that you're at, we will help you uh, in terms of uh, get a user group started. So uh, as, as Todd said, I think it's a great way to share info and and that you know that really is going to be our our strategy to to engage uh with with our customers is to have the, the folks doing the work you know learn from each other and uh and and get up to speed uh that way so chris i want to take that one specifically and maybe follow up with you the citrix user group thing there's so much potential there but you run into a situation where there might not be the the right ctp in a market or maybe that ctp is not the most um uh, uh, doesn't have the biggest personality and the markets where you have them, it's great. The markets where you don't have them, it's a struggle. I, I would love to talk to you more about how to get Citrix more involved. A quick example. I just led a Citrix user group here the other day. It was a great event. We didn't have enough, enough attendance, but great event. But the one I went to just before that, I walked in and a Citrix salesperson was presenting the technology mm -hmm. why a sales engineer stood over in the corner and didn't say a word. I want to work with you to fix that. All right. Yeah. Hey, I'm the guy now. So, uh, well, my team, but, you know, feel free to reach out to me uh, and we need to, we need to fix that. Um, and by the, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a lot of them are connected to CTPs, but by the way, anybody from a user group that's interested, it doesn't have to be a CTP to be part of that. It just happens. Yeah. A lot of them are active, but uh, yeah, I'm definitely open for ideas on improving the, the user group, both, both in terms of quality and, and reach. Yeah, and, I think the, have, go ahead. and I think the important part here is, you know, get involved, get go out to mycugc.org and sign up. Uh, there's a variety of local user groups, but then there's also a, a ton of virtual events that are going on. Uh, everything from discussion boards to virtual webinars to special interest groups as well. So uh, once again, if you go out to mycugc.org, CUG, register yeah. and uh, start participating. Yeah, thank, thanks for pointing that out. You're right. It doesn't have to just be local. It's, uh, you know, that, that's one thing that COVID, you know, did positively. It, it kind of forced the, uh, uh, that, that infrastructure or, you know, engagement to, to go virtual and make it available uh, cool. to everybody. That's what I'm excited about here. I think Chris, you can nationally influence that with a local effect, uh, with a uh, with using your place in this with a, a true technologist is what I'm getting at, um, and and that should help us overcome the kind of stigma that the Citrus User Group has been tagged with in many places, not all, but in some places, a lot of places these days. Okay, and and again, yeah, I, I'm sure it's not 
Perfect. But we 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 need the feedback, <laughs> good, bad, or ugly, <laughs> to uh, to make it better. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Bill, anything you want to ask Chris while we still got him on here? Well, I just I'm just pleased to see that the programs, you know, CUGC in particular, of course, but also the CTP and CTA programs. We uh, we work we at Zentegra work with uh, several of the CTPs. We have one that's that's a contractor for us regularly, and um, so I see the value. I know the value of those folks and and the knowledge that they that they possess and the ability to share that knowledge effectively. So very glad to see those programs continue. Uh, I think they're valuable for Citrix, for partners, and for the customers. Um, and obviously CUGC, the, the only thing I would add to what Todd said is CUGC is a good source of blogs as well. Um, I, I know that I've had several of them shared with me recently from my team saying, hey, check this out, this uh, this new way of doing something. So those are are very welcome as well. Yeah. Good, great feedback, thanks. So Chris, your chance, anything that uh, we haven't brought up here that you wanna get out while we've got listeners listening? Yeah, well, I would say the, the big one is, and you you brought it up, the fact that you discover there's a browser <laughs> hidden inside Workspace app. Like go try it out, try out the uh, the, the enterprise browser uh, sure. because I'm sure, I guarantee everyone listening here has end users using web apps. You know, they're probably both internal guaranteed with SaaS apps as well. Um, and this is a way to add security and to pull it together with your existing virtual apps uh, and do it, you know, seamlessly. So uh, that, that's my one ask is try out the uh, the enterprise browser and uh, give us feedback. Give me feedback. It's, it's I think it's uh, a really strategic, um, you know, initiative uh, for Citrix and uh want to see that succeed here's a dumb question for you can i pin that thing to the start bar or task bar or both the browser um yes now what you can't do yet but coming <laughs> is uh launching it separate from the the um workspace app okay. right now it's you've got to be in workspace app but we're we're the path we're on is to to make that more and more of a uh a primary ui so we're very, very um, in tune with security conversations here internally and with our customers. I would love just to take all the browsers out of my OS and uh, just use the uh, secure browser, both the enterprise browser from Citrix. Right. I still like the secure browser service name, but whatever it's called, right. I would like to just have those. And that's it. That's all you could use on a Zintegra owned machine. That would be awesome. Yeah, that makes sense, right? It, it makes sense and it puts you in control and you can have a combination of whether you're running them local or running them virtually and you decide based on the kind of the, the security requirements and the features you need. Yeah. Hey, is that thing Chromium based? What's the underpinning? Yep. yep. Okay. So it, it's Chromium based and, um, you know, so we we added our own IP uh, on, on top of that. But uh, the fact that it's Chromium based means that you kind of inherit the compatibility uh, that that you get uh, from from Chrome in yeah. terms of, you know, all the, the web apps that are out there. So in theory, if it doesn't work, it's because it's not supposed to. Or if it doesn't work, it can be evolved to work because of that Chromium under, underpinning. Yep. Yep. That's and, awesome. and, you know, one of the questions that comes up is, well, what happens when you get a, a vulnerability, you know, a CVE against, uh, you know, Chrome or Chromium? Yeah. And, and we've got uh, we, we've got an answer for that as well to, to do a, a rapid update. So here's one for you guys um, real quick. So I don't put Chrome on my devices anymore. It's in my virtual desktop. My team put it in there. Um, can I can I uninstall Edge? Remember when you couldn't uninstall Internet Explorer? Can you uninstall Edge? I am pretty sure the answer is yes, because on most new OSs, you have to install it. I mean, like I know on server OSs and I know on Windows 10, you typically have to go out and install it because by default, it puts either the old Edge or, or dare I say, IE on there. Um, so I know that you can you have to install it on there. So I presume you can uninstall it on Windows 11. I don't know. Yeah. So I think it's native to Windows 11. Well, I'm going to be trying that today. And if I can, <laughs> I started to type I explore in the search window and Edge comes up. I don't know if Internet Explorer is even still on this thing, but I'm going to go look around. I'm going to see if I can rip out all the browsers and just use that one and see how it goes. Great. I'd love to hear the uh, the, the outcomes. Yeah. 
Well, Chris, thanks for joining. Thanks for going through what was in the uh, the blog with us and uh, glad to see Citrix um, coming back to its roots. Great. Well, thanks for the feedback and the encouragement and looking forward to, to working with uh, you and team to, uh, to not only, you know, get the message out, but also, uh, you know, help, help your, your customers, uh, you know, manage their environments. So I, I just thought of this one, hopefully it doesn't put you on the spot. And I know you can't officially answer it yourself, but we would love to have synergy back. Any thoughts on that one? Yeah. Um, personally, I would as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, what? next year, I'm not anticipating it. We will be doing some uh, regional events, uh, but not the, the big full scale synergy. Uh, you know, I look beyond next year, you know, I'm, I'm I'm hopeful because it really is, you know, there, there's something about the, the in real life kind of yeah. engagement that you get, uh, so here's, with, especially with a global kind of audience. That, right. uh, Just my quick thoughts on that. I would combine the Synergy Roadshows with CUGC XLs and maybe it would breathe life into the CUGC stuff in a, and you'll get kill two birds, one stone kind of thing. So, so awesome. literally that is on the, you, you can expect some of that. Okay. Yep. I would I would not let the CUGCs do Excels all by themselves. I would combine the two, and and try to you know use the two to to bounce off each other. Right. Right. Yep. Um, so yeah, that that's a current uh, discussion that we had Friday and going to continue this week. Yeah, that'd be uh, great. Looking at the schedules there. Well, Chris, thanks for the time. I'm sure you got other things to go do. We we appreciate it, and we look forward to talking to you again down the road. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Chris. Great. Thank you, Chris. Fun talk. Bye.